a category of government activity that poses the gravest danger to our continued freedom is the activity not within the proper sphere of government. The Constitution provides the federal government with no authority to grant such powers as welfare programs, schemes for redistributing the wealth, and activities that coerce people into acting in accordance with a prescribed code of social planning. There is one simple test to the constitutionality of a principle. Do I, as an individual, have a right to use force upon my neighbor to accomplish this goal? If I do, then I may delegate that power to my government to exercise it in my behalf. If I do not have that right, I cannot delegate it. If we permit government to manufacture its own authority and to create self-proclaimed powers not delegated to it by the people, then the creature exceeds the creator and becomes master. Who is to say this far but no farther? What clear principle will stay the hand of government from reaching farther and farther into our daily lives? Grover Cleveland said that though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. Once government steps over this clear line between the protective or negative role into the aggressive role of redistributing the wealth through taxation and providing so-called benefits for some of its citizens, it becomes a, mean for, a means for legalized plunder. Examples abound in the world of the failure of alternative systems to the free market. What amazes me is that we cannot see from their example the obvious failure of socialism, what it does to a nation's economy, and how it morally debilitates a people. Great Britain is a tragic example of this. I was there just a short time ago. Here is a nation that I love, and here is a nation which has provided the free world with a tradition of freedom and democratic rights stemming from Magna Carta and coming down through other important historical documents and statements by famous Englishmen. Yet England today is losing her freedom. She has become a giant welfare state. Today, government spending in Britain amounts to 60% of her total national income. This is socialism. Medical doctors under socialized medicine are leaving Great Britain in record numbers, as are thousands of others. British Prime Minister James Callaghan, in a speech last September, said, quote, We used to think that you could just spend your way out of a recession and increase employment by cutting taxes and boosting government spending. I tell you in all candor that that option no longer exists, and that insofar as it ever did exist, it only worked by injecting bigger doses of inflation into the economy, followed by higher levels of unemployment as the next step. That is the history of the past 20 years." Unquote. Such a confession has led the renowned economist Dr. Milton Friedman to comment, quote, that must surely rank as one of the most remarkable and courageous statements ever made by a leader of a democratic government. Read it again. Savor it. It is a confession of the intellectual bankruptcy of the policy that has guided every British government in the post-war period. Not only Labour governments, but also Tory governments. Of the policy that has guided almost every other Western government including the United States, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, of the policy that is now being recommended to Mr. Carter by his advisors." Unquote. Consider another example. Our neighbor to the north, Canada. For 20 years, 1944 to 1964, Saskatchewan, Canada, lived under a socialist government. Here is what their premier, the Honorable W. Ross Thatcher, 
said about this experience, quote, in 1944, the socialists said they would solve the unemployment problems by building government factories. They promised to use the profits to build highways, schools, hospitals, and to finance better social welfare measures generally. Over the years, they set up 22 so-called crown or government corporations. By the time we had taken over, at the end of the 20-year period, 12 of the crown corporations had gone bankrupt or been disposed of. Others were kept operating by repeated and substantial government grants. During the whole period, the socialists waged war against private business. The making of profits was condemned as an unforgivable sin. What was the result? Investors simply turned their backs on the socialists. Dozens of oil companies pulled up stakes and moved out. Gas exploration ground to a complete halt. Prospecting in our vast north became almost non-existent. During the period, Canada was experiencing the greatest economic boom in her history. Saskatchewan received only a handful of new factories. After 18 years of socialism, there were fewer jobs in manufacturing than existed in 1945. This despite the investment of $500 million in crown corporations. During the period, more than 600 completely new taxes were introduced. 650 other taxes were increased. Per capita taxes in Saskatchewan were soon substantially out of line with our sister provinces. One more reason why industry located elsewhere. The socialists promised to make Saskatchewan a mecca for the working man. Instead, we saw the greatest mass exodus of people out of an area since Moses led the Jews out of Egypt. <laughs> since the war, 270,000 of our citizens left Saskatchewan to find employment elsewhere. If there are any Americans who think that socialism is the answer, I wish they would come to Saskatchewan to study what has happened to our province." Unquote. We say it can't happen here. The lesson of New York City should tell us that this same thing is happening here to us now. As Dr. Friedman has pointed out, New York City is no longer governed by its elected officials. It is governed by a committee of overseers appointed by the state of New York. New York City has partially lost its freedom. When will we learn the lesson? That fiscal irresponsibility leads to a loss of self-government. When will we learn that when you lose economic independence, you lose political freedom? We have accepted a frightening degree of socialism in our country. The question is how much? The amount of freedom depends upon the amount of federal control and spending. A good measurement is to determine the amount or percentage of income of the people which is taken over and spent by the state. In Russia, the individual works almost wholly for the state, leaving little for his own welfare. Scandinavia takes about 65 to 70 percent of the increase of the people. England, some 60 percent. The United States is now approximately 44 percent. America was built on the principle of faith in God, self-reliance, the profit motive, individual action, and voluntary charity. It was built by those who believed that the surest helping hand was at the end of their own sleeves. These forefathers of ours shared one thing in common, an unshakable faith in God and a faith in themselves. There are indications that America is moving away from the philosophy that made her the most prosperous nation in the world. 